Hi everyone, this is Women's Grandmaster Sabina Hoysher. I'm here at the St. Louis Chess Club and for today's lecture we are going over the Grandmaster's choice, which is gonna be my choice for today. And for today I chose fighting chess. Um, I really enjoy a good um, attacking game and um, I've seen a couple of very interesting games that are uh, taking place at the moment uh, in the European chess championship and uh, the first game that I want to show you today and I want us to go over is a game between Anton Korobov and former World Cup uh, champion uh, Ruslan Ponomaryov uh, and uh, Korobov is known for his uh, amazing I think attacking style and uh, he's played in a lot of uh, GCT events and um, I really I really thought I really thought this game was brilliant, um, you know, so let's get started. So Korobov start, started with d4, and welcome everyone, by the way, if you are watching us, you know, from home, from somewhere, hi, I hope you're doing well, uh, and welcome everyone who's here at the club, I hope you guys will enjoy this game, and hopefully you haven't seen it, so that we can learn some interesting things. So Korobov um, is a very strong grandmaster from Ukraine, same as uh, Ponomaryov. And they played the, um, basically this is, this is anti Nimzo Indian, right? So if you play knight c3 in this position, black typically responds with bishop b4. Uh, and then there are various moves that white can play in this position. Queen c2 is one of them. I used to play this so many times when I was a kid. It was one of my pet lines. I won so many games. But there are, of course, some other variations that white can go for. e3 is one of the most played lines. Uh, and knight f3 and a3 and pretty much everything. I think it's very important when you're learning an opening whether it is you know, for white an opening or for black a defense, it's very important to know the key squares. And a very important square in the Nimzo Indian is the e4 square. So um, here, the, the purpose of queen c2 is of course to control the e4 square so that we can get to play e4 because we couldn't currently, of course, because you know we're being pinned, so we would lose a pawn. But anyways, knight f3 was the choice of, uh, of Korobov because he wanted to to play a system against the Nimzo, and now knight c3. So we transpose basically back to a queen's gambit. For those of you who maybe are new to chess or interested in this, and you don't know what move orders are, you basically can get to the exact same position if you were to play like this. So we have the exact same position. Now, if black wanted to play just the normal queen's gambit decline, they could have just continued with bishop e7, but Ponomaryov chose the line with bishop b4, uh, which is also called the Ragozin defense. And, um, you know, I was, I was quite excited to see this game because I often struggled against the Ragozin. I had a very painful loss one time in the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. Women's Championship, and you know, Bishop G5 is kind of the most played line. And then when I saw this game, I was like, hmm, maybe I came up with a new. Well, I didn't come up. I just saw a new idea. That's why you know it's really cool to check top players' games because um, you end up uh, you end up finding new lines that maybe you weren't familiar with, or maybe you are struggling with the one line and you didn't know what to do, and suddenly you see an idea uh, that could become part of your repertoire. So maybe for someone who's a, a beginner, let's say, you're being told not to take your queen out early. But the point of this move is, um, of course, it's a check bishop, but the point is to get black to play knight c6. With black, you typically want to find a way to push the c pawn, whether it is c6 or c5, you want that pawn pushed so that you're giving yourself a little bit more space. But in this position, queen a4, it does take the queen out early, but it also forces the knight to go to c6. And because the knight is there, um, it's the, the knight would have to move eventually back so that the pawn pushes. And yeah, maybe white's queen is kind of out of play here, but don't worry, we will be bringing it back into, into play ev eventually. Okay, so white continues their development. Now, e3 is the most natural 
uh, move for white. Bishop g5 is another option. Uh, but, uh, but the reason we play e3 is to make sure we're protecting this pawn. And so we do with this c4 pawn by opening the bishop. Castle, bishop d2. Now white does not want to allow the doubling of the pawns here. So if you were to take, obviously we would capture back with the bishop. I see a lot of people in the chat are saying hi. I know a lot of them by their username, so thanks for stopping by. Uh, and here, this was the move that I was quite excited to see. So bishop d6, c5. Why is this important? Well, typically you see black returning with a bishop in e7. Like, this is, uh, this is something you expect, or capturing in c3 like I showed you. The point with bishop d6 is to actually attract c5, and you would think with black that this move is not very good for white, because typically, if you choose to blockade the position in the center, you are giving black the option to push later on e5 and kind of have a clear attacking plan in the center and the king side. So this is a move that I often tell my students not to play, whether it is in the London system uh, with black or sometimes with white. I tell them don't play that unless you're sure you can come up with a good plan to give your, uh, yourself more space on the queen side, like really. And you can actually open up the position because otherwise black has a very simple plan. But Korobov, he played this move and um, he actually played it quite, quite fast, I would say. If you guys, uh, I, I believe it is visible in, in the video as well. You see, he had like a minute, third, almost a minute 32 and he got to 129. He's, he spent a little bit of time in this and there weren't so many games actually played in this specific position. But he went for the move. And obviously, when you go for such a move again, you need to make sure you have a very clear plan of how to continue to push the pawns forward and attack on the queen side. Because otherwise, black will prep to play e5, e4, and start the pawn march on the king side. Okay, so b4, let's go for the attack, fighting chess, attacking chess. I love this. The reason I love fighting chess so much and, and attack, whether it does, like, even if it's not towards the king directly, it's because I don't think I play it very well myself. Like when I end up playing, uh, I'm more of a positional player. So uh, every time I try to push the pawns too much, I end up just, you know, messing up. So it's always nice to see other players do it. Maybe one day I will learn it myself. And, uh, so, okay, so knight e4, a very natural move to kind of block all kind of ideas for white to e even consider to play e4, although those wouldn't be very good. Clearly, white is going to push the pawns on the queen side. And, um, and maybe getting some ideas with f5. Does anyone in, in the audience, and then, of course, people can write in the chat as well, I'll check it, know who kind of came up with these ideas with the f pawn push? It was Pillsbury. Pillsbury kind of had this idea. I actually wrote an article about it um, last year. <laughs> um, he came up with the idea of for white to play f4, f5. And um, you, you see this kind of approach when the center is blocked. You, it's fine for black to push the pawn and it would be fine for white because there would be no way for the king to be in danger because the diagonal is locked. Uh, but you can use f5, f4 as a means to attack. So white needs to rush in this position. So he went for, <laughs> he went for, for uh, b5. Yes, uh, Yasser Sarawan, a great commentator, and he's, he's often here uh, at the club, often says push, push the pawns, push them as much as possible. And however, just keep in mind, once you push a pawn, you can't go back. So when you push them, make sure you're not leaving too much stuff behind, too many squares that you cannot control anymore that could be utilized by your opponent because then, you know, there's a trade-off. But here's the thing. As soon as white played b5, he kind of allowed uh, black to capture in d2. So 
what's, what's going on? I'm reading some of the tweets. I'm not reading, sorry, so, some of the chat. I'm not reading all of it because <laughs> then I'll definitely get distracted from the game. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of peeking through it a little bit. So there's this idea for Black's Knight to capture the bishop in d2. Should we worry? Well, we already pushed b5, so there's no turning back. So obviously he probably thought about it when he played b5. But now let's think about it ourselves. Would it be okay, uh, would we be fine with white if black were to capture our bishop in d2? Um, all right, someone is saying that the bishop is blocked by the pawns. That is right. This bishop is quite restricted. We have a lot of pawns. Maybe I should choose another color because that orange wasn't really visible. But uh, the bishop is really blocked, so you are actually quite fine if black, who's moved this knight already twice, would capture your bishop because, you know, the, your bishop doesn't do much, so you would have to find a way to actually open up the position for this bishop to do something. But, uh, but what to do? Because, like, after b5, you have to go back knight to b8 if you're not going to take in d2. And then white's, white's follow-up would probably be capturing here. And then maybe knight e5. And um, I think white's position is more than, more than comfortable. Like, then we would have you know the rook coming to b1, the knight can go to c4 in case it's going to be chased away. This bishop goes to e2. At some point, you can certainly consider you know, to play f3. And I know um, you might be worried because you don't have a knight in f3 anymore, but it's perfectly fine for white to go bishop e2 and castle short and then consider f3 after you have castled. This would give you, it would bring your king to safety and would give you activity uh, and attack on the king side as well. Someone was asking, was asking to look at probably Epsimenko's game you're saying I love this game so I'm looking at this game for now hopefully you guys enjoyed this game as well it was a great win by Korobov who by the way is the only player in the European Championship to have five out of five pretty much everyone like first 10 boards or so I think there was just another decisive result everything everyone else kind of went for draws so and these players are from the same country I mean you know and they played as teammates for Olympic, for the uh, their Olympic team for for many years, so I think it's kind of a great <laughs> great fight in a way. Um, so he decided to take here first, and the question is, how do we capture back? We got two options: we got the knight or the king. What do we choose? Yeah, in the previous position, there was not so much the black could do. Bad bishops support good pawns. Uh, that's right. That that could be that could be a thing for sure. In the audience here in the club, does anyone want to take a choice with the knight? What do you think? Same. Yeah. So normally, <laughs> normally we would capture with the knight, of course, because you know it's it's you know our king. We want to castle, right? And then bishop d3, uh, and then castle, of course. Uh, but, okay, this would be definitely a continuation here, here. And then I feel that black should kind of give himself a little bit of space on the queen side. Um, and then we would probably castle. And uh, maybe they try to do something like this, so they trade that their bad bishop. And the position is quite balanced. The interesting thing in this game is that Korobov did not capture with the knight. I had to come up with something, something cool. Um, so he captured with the king and he captured quite fast. Look at that. He almost didn't think at all in this position. He just captured and... Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's my choice today. I'm sorry, guys. It's my choice. So this was my choice. Maybe, maybe one day it would be the, the, the chat's choice or, um, you know, I think tomorrow I actually am doing game analysis. So if you guys have games, that will be your choice. You can give me your games and then, I'll, you know, you will be choosing what's happening in the, in the class. 
Okay, so king takes d2, what? King in the center? Why is this okay? Because the position is blocked. This move is not possible right now. The knight is hanging. So he has to move the, the knight back. And now white basically has the same position. Just he doesn't need to castle because he plays bishop d3. And suddenly white has completed development. The two rooks are connected. And uh, he can choose actually which side of the board he wants his king to go to. If he feels that the center gets open, maybe he's going to go to c2. If not, maybe he will shift on the other side. So uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of cool. It's, I think this move is really cool. And nobody, at least Lee Chess, um, had no games. I haven't had the chance to check the database to see if there were any other games. If any of you have the chance to do that, please do so. But, um, but there are no games. He just went king takes d2. Wow. OK, so c6. Black is trying to give himself some space. Now, we have to talk about plans because Black is struggling with the space, so he does want to play something like bishop d7 and try to trade, as I showed you previously. This move would be great as well, but he has to support it with f6. And even so, it's not a move that black might be ready to play. Um, so he started with c6 first, rook b1, and uh, c takes b5. Why not b6 here after c6, someone is asking me. Great question. Great question. Why do you think we don't play this? After this, white's position is really, really bad. Because when, when you realize that you have more space on one side of the board, so in this case, right, the, the board cuts off in the middle, and we definitely have these pawns blocked here, so this is the difference. This pawn in c5 versus this pawn in c6. So when you have more space on one side of the board and your pawns also kind of point out towards that direction, that is the side of the board where you want to play. What does that mean? You want to find a way to push the pawns forward, trade them off with the opponent's pawns, so that you open up files for your pieces to get into play, because you don't have other way to enter in your opponent's territory. For them, they have to play on the other side. So if you're going to play b6, you're basically kind of cutting off a lot of your resources to open up a file. You want to take here eventually, but you're not going to take right now. If you take too soon, you're helping your opponent. How? Well, he wants to get with that knight back out, so he's just going to capture with the knight. His knight is back out and um, developed. <laughs> Nobody gets to chase him ever again. And yes, you open up the b file, but that pawn is easily protected by black with rook b8, even queen c7. He can protect it. He's got his knight back and he's happy. So before you're going to take, you will make sure to place your pieces on, on much better positions, on the best possible positions you can, so that when you take, you're actually opening up your pieces. So uh, with b6, yes? Why would you take? So now it's black to move. So let's say black would just develop. So you would take, right? Mm -hmm. So now when you take here, you're still stuck. Like you're blocked this pawn. Um, you, can't, you can't promote it, you're, you're stuck there. Whenever you want to support that pawn in any way, you would have to get the knight like this, right? For that to happen, the queen has to move. So that's the, the moment he will take. But right now the pawn is not dangerous because it's blocked and you cannot get black's rook away from there, which means that black can focus uh, in the center. And I don't know if he needs f6, he might be able to just play e5 directly. And since you've got the king in the center, he's trying to break your chain. Now, obviously he has this threat as well, fork. So you either are going to move one of these two pieces because taking, he's just very happy. Right, takes, takes, and then he takes, and that pawn will fall. It, it's like a lonely pawn, it's not protected anymore. And if the rook wasn't in a8, of course you should, you should take and try to promote it. This kind of situation also happens sometimes on the king side, because um, like oftentimes people allow a pawn to go all the way to h7, and then they just go king h8. Maybe you've seen something like that before. So when that happens, it's really sad for white because they cannot just bring their king sorry their queen to capture their own pawn to mate so you're just stuck your own pawn is actually stopping your fight and your attack so 
that's that's the problem you win upon but it's not a valuable one it's not one you can actually utilize does it make sense yeah, yeah. okay um so oh someone was saying something fun actually in this position okay um it's actually a good point uh, i need to show this so what about if queen takes right this is this is a, a fun thing that you can say, wait, I take with the queen, and then when you take back, I take with the pawn, and I'm promoting. Oh my god, what are we going to do? The bishop is, is locked, we can't do anything. Well, obviously we can. What's the move? What is it? <laughs> so which piece can stop the pawn from promoting? The knight could, but that we would be very happy if the knight goes there. We take it and then we, okay, fine. I mean, you go there, but we will still be doing really well here. It's kind of crazy, but white would be doing really well there. Yeah, the queen can go here and stop the pawn. Um, kind of a backwards vision that's it's nice to have. And oftentimes we just look forward. We're so tempted to go and attack that we forget that we, we have to sometimes retreat. And this is kind of, okay, this is a forward move, but with the idea of retreating. Um, so I think here, this position, even this position, I think white is fine. White would be fine here, even if they don't promote too soon, because black would have to stay with one piece to stop that pawn. And there would also be ideas possibly with some bishop a6 at some point in an end game, and then push this, and then would have two pawns, one of those would would promote. Yeah, black is a queen up, but, but I think after either this rook or this rook, we either go bishop, some bishop a6 or we can push this and then we'll have to connect it and black doesn't have sufficient time most likely to open up. But anyways, let's go back to our game. So we want to put more pressure before we choose to open up that side of the board. So here, rook a b1, c takes b5. Um, and in this position, Korobov decided to capture with the bishop. I like this, this move. Uh, with the knight, ideally it would be nice to capture, but I think there's no, I mean, you attack that pawn, but you won't be taking it to remain pinned. Knight c6 is anyway something that black wants to do. So I think his, his choice bishop takes b5 was fine. And queen c7. I think this was probably a move, a very natural move that black might have considered, but unfortunately, this move does not work because we can just capture and if you capture with the queen of course we can just trade queens first and then take in b7 and oops and white is just crushing here extra pawn and everything so black wants to develop but he cannot so i think um i, I always recommend i know some people don't in these days you know, everyone has their own kind of way of teaching and describing things. But I think it is very, very important that you um, spend the time to study the classics and, and see some of these games where um, some players were able to, super, to really dominate their opponents. And they're, you know, world champions playing against another world champion. And they just sometimes just had these one, two mistakes where they left pieces behind um, or they thought they have sufficient time to do something and then um, because they stayed behind with the development, the other side, the other world champion um, really took advantage of uh, this. So many games that I can think of right now, classical games that something like that was happening. But okay, this position is not lost for black or anything. He's just needs to find the right way to develop his pieces without dropping material. And, uh, and going back just for one second, in case I haven't explained it very well at first, the reason black chose to take, he doesn't want to normally, he really wants to support e5, but he cannot develop otherwise. He's really struggling. He's got no place to develop his pieces. Like knight d7 just drops this pawn for free. Uh, bishop d7 allows, I think, knight e5, or maybe, or, yeah, I think knight e5 is fine. And then we take. That pawn is going to be hanging. 
because he cannot take his pieces out, he's just trying to give himself some, some air to breathe, and that's why he captures that that way. Oh, someone from Charlotte Center. Hi there. Thanks for joining our stream. All right, so finally, Black is playing f6. He really wants to support, to find a way to push this pawn forward. Bishop d7, again, was a move that he probably wanted to do. But there's this annoying knight e5, and the reason white plays this now is he's trying to keep the position a little bit locked, um, and he might want to play f4. And what do you do now? Let's say you play knight c6. I think probably we can go f4 here, or like this seems like a like a nice nice idea. And even mm. if black <coughs> gets to capture everything. Probably, I'm not sure which one, which piece, probably knight takes. This bishop, even if it's the good bishop, considering the remaining pawns that are blocked are on the opposite color, it doesn't do so much, this bishop. This knight will, sli will be slightly better, and I don't think we'll put it in d6. We might end up going back and uh, kind of doubling on the b file, putting pressure, and we might eventually even maybe get our knight too this side of the board maybe play it, it depends on what black will play it's definitely another game here but um, but I think white has a superior position due to a much better knight and slightly more space so black is trying to push to find a way to push e5 okay this bishop doesn't do much in b5 so he's back to d3 Knight c6, and the queen in a4 did its job. The point was right earlier in the game to attract the knight to go to c6 so that black remained with the pawn in c7, but now he can just go back. So he went back to c2, switching a little bit uh, and looking a little bit on the king side and try to attract black to make a pawn push to weaken his king. Because black has a pawn in f6 instead of the knight, He's really not going to be very happy to push F, sorry, to push uh, G6 or H6 because the light squares would be very weak. G6 also would, would allow at some point some sacrifice in G6. So he chose to play F5. But this move is another pawn push. What did I say earlier? Push the pawns, but think about what squares you're giving to the opponent and whether they will be able to take advantage of them. Now, by pushing F5, you are indeed blocking this bishop from looking to, to h7, but you're giving this outpost away. Uh, and here, you know, with white, what do you think would be a good plan for white in this position? Like, what, what should white do? The black kind of blocked things. Definitely e5 is going to be tough to play now because that pawn might be hanging, this pawn might stay weak. So what should white do here? <clears throat> Okay. I think normally this king does not belong there. At this point, it doesn't belong there anymore. So you would love if you could just suddenly just make this move, just bring your king sa to safety first, and then you know do something. Uh, on YouTube, Chris is saying knight e1, play f4, and then knight back to f3. Okay, I mean that's an option, I guess. Um, but why would you do that? Like, you know, why, why would you want to do that, though? It's... Oh, I know why you do that. If you know, if you know me and you've watched me when I stream sometimes, um, I talk about one of my favorite games. People joke about it at this point. It's, it's Capablanca Trey Ball game. Um, that game, if you haven't seen it, you definitely need to check it out. In that game, Capablanca ends up having the pawns placed like that, exactly as my V-shape. Um, and everything is blocked and exactly goes that way. So he's actually gaining a lot of space on this side of the board. 
and then he switches over on this side because he realizes his opponent is going to push. So in order to stop his opponent, he actually does something like that, like Chris says on, on YouTube. And then he goes h3, g4, g5, and literally his pawns end up going like this. If you don't know that game, definitely check it out after this class. Um, you're going to enjoy it. And you're going to understand me better <laughs> for next time. Um, so that's a nice idea indeed. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's going to be in the end, like you can't really utilize that square. So I'd rather use um, h h3, h4, maybe h3, g4 is saying someone else. Um, knight e2, f4, and h4. Knight on this side of the board. Very interesting. Lots of interesting ideas that I actually hadn't thought about when I looked at this game. Um, maybe this is not... I feel though if you do that, it's not that you don't have time, you do have. Maybe black will also have time to bring in his bishop. That's basically black's worst place piece. When you don't know what to do in a position, you got two things that you can do in my opinion. One of them, check your pawn structure and look on the side of the board where you have more space. That is the side of the board where you probably have to find a way to get in your pieces to attack. Um, other thing is look, or maybe it's going to be three, maybe I'll add, there'll be three things. Second one, look for your worst place piece and try to find a way to improve it. And last one, it's so cliche that I say that it's three. I need to come up with an additional one. By the end of my residency here, I will. Third one would be look for your opponent's worst place piece and see if you can find a way to annoy it even further. Those are things that you can do. I'll come up with a fourth, I promise, because I don't want a cliche. Everyone has three questions at this point. I don't want three questions. <laughs> I want something extra. Well, I'm creative enough. It, it will come, don't worry. But anyways, in this position, Korobov was like, nah. I'm going to go knight b5. Forget about improving things. Let me do this first. And I thought it was interesting in a way because he just came back with a knight from there. So you're thinking, well, he's not going to get to d6. What's even the point of this move? Like, why, why is he playing it? Well, to chase the queen away, that's for sure. Queen b8 was played by, by uh, uh, Ponomaryov. And I was like, well, why didn't he go there? But then, but then you're thinking, okay, then maybe we do have time. We do have a lot of time to do whatever we wanted with g3. Maybe g3 is the move. Or just, you know, bring the king there. Maybe like Chris said, move the knight. I just don't like knight e1. I feel like it's too passive. not necessary to go there to go f4. Something else should be. You know what? I would like to go king e2, h3, g4. You know, someone said it in the chat, I think, this idea. That's what I would do. Because we're talking fighting chess. Let's just be aggressive. It's not our pieces, right? We can do that. <laughs> no, but seriously, that is a good plan. That is a really, really wise, um, wise idea for white to open up their bishop. And then um, if black, obviously black should not take in g4. But then we could try to push and give ourselves a little bit more space on the king side if we wanted. What I found interesting is here after queen b8, queen c3 was played. So maybe he kept the queen in b8 to support this move, but I always felt that that pawn was hanging. But maybe Ponomario somehow thought that that's an option. So Korobov's like, nope, not happening. You're not going to play e5. I'm controlling that square very well. And then um, Black was like, okay, now it's the time. Let me chase you back. You have to play to knight a3. And then at least I chased you back and you don't go to c3 because you just, you just blocked your square. The thing is, white didn't really block the square there because um, he actually did something good. When you only have one bishop left on the board, you want to place your queen on the opposite color. Everyone knew this? Here? Yeah? Good. Um, so that's kind of what he did as well by, by making this move. And guess what? No, he didn't go to a3. Why would he? When he can go to d6. Cool stuff. Here comes the fighting chess that I love. Why? Because he's just giving up a pawn, right? I mean, what? 96. Thank you very much for the pawn. I'm taking it. And I'm feeling very comfortable about, about this. You know, I have a pawn up. I have a bad bishop, but no worries. 
I'm gonna try to find a way to protect this pawn, maybe rook b8, maybe rook a7, get my bishop out, maybe push some b5, something. I'll come up with something. When you give up a pawn, you don't just give up a pawn like that because you, you're nice. You're never nice. Your opponents, you know, you, you want to win your games against your opponent, not be nice to them. So this is a really beautiful, in my opinion, pawn sacrifice. It's also just temporary because he's trying to keep black underdeveloped with those pieces. Even if it's going to take forever for the bishop to go out, he still wants to make sure the bishop stays there. So he played this move, rook to b6 exactly someone said it in the chat good um and if i miss some of your comments i apologize i try to make sure i go through this game because i get very excited and distracted rook b6 all right so we're pinning the knight but also we have this kind of idea bishop takes a6 a very typical tactical idea for positions where uh you know a knight on c6 on c3 it happens very often in Sicilians sometimes or in some other maybe even Queen's Gambits it can happen sometimes that there's a knight here in c3 a pawn in b2 pawn in b3 and sometimes you suddenly if you're not careful there's a bishop takes deflecting your pawn from there and your knight is hanging that's the exact same approach in this position we want to take and then that knight would be hanging so Ponomarev went back as you can see, he cannot just develop the bishop because obviously that pawn is hanging. And this position is going to be tough. Let's just say you are thinking, you know what? I'm going to trade the rook. I'm going to trade a pair of rooks and I'll be fine. Well, you always have to check to look for uh, checks and captures. In fact, recently I've been, I've been studying this, um, this course um, on chessable that I like it's called it's by Judith Polgar and she has this thing that's called CCTV and uh, it's checks captures oh my goodness I forgot what the other two stand for this is bad um, check out what CCTV stands for let me know by the end of this okay rook takes e7 checks captures It sounds like uh, one of those places where, where you sell things in the US. I think she didn't think about that when she created her acronym, but um, <laughs> okay, nobody's checking it. Okay, there is the small little capture. So you sack the rook for two pieces you, and you basically just you know win two, pie two pieces for the rook. And, um, and then uh, this position is gonna be really variations, variations. And one more, <laughs> one more thing. All right. And that's what's happening if you develop the bishop. Going back, queen d8. Okay. He's so passive. He's on the back rank. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to improve some more pieces. We're going to make sure the bishop stays there. We have the pressure. No rush. Queen c5. I like this move. Black play rook f7. And here, I think this is one of those moments, like there are two or three moments in this game that Karbov maybe hasn't played the most precise way, let's say. But we're all human. We all want, it's hard sometimes to play without a pawn. Like we do make the sacrifice. We feel we're good. But then sometimes we're saying, okay, when is the moment to get it back? And he kind of went to get the pawn back right now. Threats and variations, okay, CC, checks, captures, threats and variations, thank you. Um, a couple of people said it in the chat, for those of you here, now you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so you always want to, to consider forcing moves, basically. The more forcing, the better. And threats, you know, can be mating threat, the next move or in a couple of moves and um, like serious stuff, not just, oh, I have a threat to bring the knight 10 moves and I get there or something, no. There should be a mate threat, typically. Okay, so rook f7. So he went for the pawn. But okay, now we have the time. We're not in a rush, in a big rush. He, how much time did he spend here to go for? Like two minutes to play bishop takes a6, get his pawn back. And he probably thought that 
in case of a recapture of course maybe he would take back here and he would be like tripled on the c file the knight would come afterwards to e5 he would have just you know a great position how can we try to improve with white the position further because black literally has no moves this bishop cannot be developed that's hanging um he doesn't really he doesn't really i think he doesn't really want to do a move like this i don't think that that move would be possible so he he cannot really escape from this queen side what can we do opening a file might be risky for white um no why would it be risky because the king is in d2 the king can always go to e2 and make sure it stays kind of protected here protecting f2 f f2 is a pawn that could become weak if you're going to go g4 g4 is quite typical so we could open up a file if you want to do something like this um but he also might want to play f4 maybe maybe he has one little tiny little thing that he could do playing f4 i guess but then you would do this so you would keep it close a4 a5 okay that's not too that's interesting but then if you do that your queen will be kind of stuck to protect the pawn otherwise you'll lose it so i'm not sure if you want to push this pawn to a5 to get it to a square where it might be weak <laughs> you could also try to improve the position like if you just do this and this and just improve it and see what he does it's like what what moves is black going to come up with next literally because literally this move you do nothing you can even take but you can just do nothing you can just i think you can just do this because if he takes you take back and again he cannot get the bishop out he cannot do this because he's pinned over here if he goes rook a7 then i think we go knight here because he's pinned over here so there are a lot of difficult things that black is struggling with so white can just afford to make a few improvement moves and only after that you can take you have the time to do it because he does not have threats if he had threats then you wouldn't waste the time like that but he went for the pot okay and in this position he gave black the opportunity to give a pawn back play bishop d7 give the pawn like another pawn like just be like take it if you want but um white cannot because if you do then maybe he's finally getting some activity for the rook that was stuck earlier um now you really do understand that this king could have gotten let's say a little bit in danger and then um i think after that maybe there was uh, i think there was this move or something like this that was able to be played and if you go rook b5 then we'll probably take it wait there might be some discovery i'm messing up some something in this line White has to give up the queen and get this position. Now here we still have ideas with rook c8 and try to win, try to win the queen back. We have knight e5. We should have sufficient compensation for the queen. We have uh, a rook and uh, and a knight for the queen, and he's still restricted on the king side. But why would we do that, right? He was so restricted, and in a few moves you get from this position where he had nothing to do. We could just improve first even bring our king to g1 if we wanted into that position where we actually have material disadvantage so i think bishop d7 kind of had to be played and obviously you can't take another way and um, if you go back or something then you know there, this pawn is still hanging and whether you go rook c2 or king e1 the same kind of the same kind of thing happens he's he's out he's just out black for some reason uh, Ponomario, for some reason, in this position, played rook c7. Um, he probably thought that white is stuck now that he took the pawn in a6. He probably thought that um, the, the bishop is pinned, it won't be able to move, and then this pawn in a2 would be hanging. <laughs> Mm, 
But knight e5, putting extra pressure on the knight because actually you just pinned yourself. And the thing is that now a move like bishop d7 is not exactly the same as it was before. Because, um, because why? Because now we can, we can do this. And you, you cannot move the bishop because this pawn will be hanging if you go like bishop there, for example. Why couldn't you do the same thing earlier? Because, you, because your rook was hanging. But <coughs> now, I, I want you to see clearly the difference. Now, there's a rook there that blocks. So now we can play queen b6. And black is totally stuck. So Ponomaryov is, is very resourceful. I mean, he won the World Cup, right? So he's a very strong player. He came up with this idea of queen h4 and trying to take advantage of the king from this other side, since he wasn't able to bring in the rook that way. So queen h4, and, um, and in this position, you have to make a decision with white. Are you going to move the king to e2 and try to protect? Are you going to try to play g3? Or will you retreat with your knight back to d3, so lose the pressure on c6 in order to protect f2? Because clearly that is the most dangerous square on the board for your king, and you don't want to let them. And at least according to the engines, <laughs> uh, king, king e1, the move that was played, was not optimal for, for white in this position. It's a very natural human move, king u2 or king u1, I think. King u1, probably a little bit more than king u2, because in e2, you're still staying on this check. So there would still be queen, rook takes a2 check. Whereas when, where, uh, when the king is in e1 and you are um, like protecting the pawn, you're also not staying. So at some point, you might be able to move the bishop without being worried they take this pawn with check. But um, it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of interesting that um, I think the best move that was suggested was g3. Like I don't think I would ever play this move g3 because I'm not an engine, obviously. But <coughs> just naturally, like just takes and then that pawn is hanging again. So like, what's even the point to give the pawn h2 unless you are sure that eventually, after you protect it, you'll be able to come back and trap the queen which is a possibility, but I don't see a follow-up on the H file. So I wouldn't give up the pawn like that. I would rather just go back and not waste the pawn move. And then if they do take it, I feel that we could utilize this move for something better, unless we don't find anything better, which probably we don't. <laughs> but it just, it just seems kind of strange. Like, I don't, I don't know. If I would see queen H, queen H5, if I had seen queen h4 as an idea for black, I would have never played knight e5. I would be scared personally. I know about you guys, but I would be personally scared. Um, anyone here in the audience scared? If you saw queen h4 or no, you'd be fine. You'd be like, oh, I just go king e1. No, you would, you would be scared? So and so, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Okay. So he went king e1. So why is this not such a good move? Well, because here's what's happening. Most of the pieces are on the queen side. The only pieces over on the king side are the queen. This knight, they can come back. And then white has some pawns. So you can tell yourself that you'll be fine because in case of anything, this move knight f3 is an option. So you can see he has a queen. Nobody has ever seen a mate just with the queen. You need a helper. And that is exactly why black would have been fine in this position if he found a way to bring a helper to help his queen take advantage of white's lonely king on the king's side. If anyone wants to give it a shot to come up with the best possible move here for black, if you want, Clearly, I think you have noticed based on my description that it's not queen takes h2. He, that's the move that was played in the game. Unfortunately, it was a big mistake after which black's position just collapses. So does anyone have any idea of what move black can try to play here 
in order to start um, or to yeah start an attack on White's King. Yes, yeah, someone on, on the chat is saying that black is probably better after bishop a6. Uh, I don't know if better, but it certainly could have escaped from that dangerous position. It was just a little bit too greedy to get the pawn back for sure. Knight takes e5. No. <laughs> Although your idea might be good if you actually had the opportunity to go knight d3. <clears throat> I would give you thumbs up. But unfortunately, <laughs> you can't because I still have my bishop there which wasn't captured because of this move, right? But now we take and you cannot, uh, you don't have a forcing move here. And for example, something like this, I feel that I could even take. And maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm being too, too aggressive. I can just go back, you know? Why, why would I worry? I want a rook. I can just go back. So I defend. Someone said it. J Shaper. Yes, the move was a f4. This was the move that black would have played in this position. So he's trying to open up white's king because literally the king is kind of lonely, just has the pawns. And for example, like, you know, if you're thinking, wait a second, I'm just going to make some trades and I'll be fine. Not really, because once this move happens, there are serious threats on your king. And let's just say you're going to consider, I don't know, maybe rook or queen back to c2. He's just going to take back and um, pretend like you're just going to make the tr this trade. The problem is there's a pawn here in your territory that's going to capture here anytime. He just needs to make sure that he doesn't lose anything on that side of the board. He's going to take. If you capture back, there's this idea or this idea. And suddenly, white's king that was safe before around here because there's no file opened or nothing, now is not safe anymore. So f4, and now white has to make a few defensive moves. Like, like I said, knight f3, a very natural backwards move, but you need to defend your king a little bit. And um, okay, if black goes back, he goes back. Okay, fine. And maybe we retreat with the bishop too or something like this, so that in case of a trade we capture back and we're staying defended there. But I think white either is gonna try to repeat the position by going back and forth, if it even works. I'm not even sure if, if it works. I don't know if we should be safe here, but it's just, it's very, <coughs> it's very difficult. It is very, very difficult for white. But luckily for him, Ponomaryov went for queen takes h2. He went for a pawn. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm really a huge fan of, I was a huge fan of um, Viktor Korchnoi, who was taking pretty much all the pawns, even poisonous ones. However, you have to be very careful and be very sharp tactically when you make these kinds of decisions. This queen is now out of play and it's not coordinated with any other piece to actually take advantage of white's king. The best it has is maybe a check here or there, the king will go to e2 and then that's it. That's it for black. What about for us? Well, how do we consider things right now? This move is so human. Yes, this move was very human, but it was also not the best, I definitely not very good. Now, white only has one way to win here, which Korobov didn't miss the chance to see. Um, and now, and now we have to look at this king and the back rank and then this hanging piece. And that's how you come up with the best move. So what is it? Back rank, rook hanging, king weak, forcing moves. Remember Judy Polgar, CCTV. Checks, captures, threats and variations. We got it. We got it. If we learn something this lesson is that Sabina forgets what she's learning 
but then people are helping her get it back and then everyone else learns. So that's, that's the right thing. <laughs> that's the right thing to do. Uh, nobody has any idea here? Maybe in the club? Ben, I'm gonna make you answer. No, Ben is not. <laughs> oh, you are gonna answer? Forcing move with attack. <laughs> You guys can do it. Um, rook takes c6. No, it's not a capture. It's a very simple move. It's a threat. It's a threat. I, I would have said queen c6, but I don't think that's. Yeah, yeah it is. It's it's for it's it's attacking. Yeah, queen d6. It, it's it's a threat. So it's one of those four, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a threat. You're bringing your queen closer to the attack, and and then you can combine it with Ben's idea, which was rook takes c6, and then he's trying to get rid of the defender of the back rank so he can mate. Didn't I hang the rook? Huh? Didn't I hang the rook on c1? Oh, yes, that's exactly what black did. Yeah. Check, right? That's what you're saying? Yeah. And taking the rook. Yes. But but now, well, first of all, we could take the rook back if we wanted, but, but we're not going to take the rook back. We want to mate this king because the back rank. So what do we do now? If we're not going to take the rook and we want to mate here? Take the knight. No, the knight. If we take the rook, we, don't ha we do have a kind of a serious threat here and, and there. That's right. But I think... I think tactically that's gonna be a. Did you see it? This guy. This cover check. Yeah. So backwards kind of idea for for the queen, and then that's a that's an issue. So we're not taking the queen. We're taking the knight, the capture, and then we want the mate. We also attack the queen, of course. And the problem is okay. First of all, we see we he cannot recapture because of mate. Um, so he's gonna give a check to escape with his queen from the attack. And then we go king f3. <clears throat> What's our threat? We still want to take the rook, but more importantly, we want to checkmate. And then um, Ponomaryov is like in huge trouble now. If he plays bishop d7, then we can just take the rook. And then this is hanging. And like I said, you see that queen entered, but it didn't take the right pawns and it didn't have support. And because of that, there was just two checks and that was it. So black's king remained weak. <clears throat> so I liked kind of in a way how although he lost some of his advantage by going to get back his pawn, he ended up just um, coming back into the game because black was a little bit greedy by capturing this pawn, I would say. And it, it's kind of a little bit surprising to me because they did have a lot of time. Both of them seem to have had a lot of time, if the times that Licha show us are correct. And then rook c7, um, he didn't even take the rook. Like, there's no point to take the rook when you can make this move and try to distract him so he can mate him now. Uh, but yeah, so, so this move was played. And then uh, I don't know if this move was played or he resigned and, and this was played. But anyways, this is, this is the final thing that we had. And um and this is how Korobov won this game. How did you guys what did you guys think about it? Did you like it? Yeah. I I really liked I really liked the game. I thought, you know, there were some important points that, that were made and both players really respected the principles. Just at some point, due to them, some tiny little inaccuracy this move was trying to attract c5 but then the c5 proved proved to be really um really good for white in the end because it just kind of gave them the um, the power to push to push over the pawns on the on the queen side and and get more more space and everything and um uh, and then uh, my my favorite thing i think my favorite move <laughs> of the game although it's not brilliant or anything do you guys know what it is? I'm gonna get to it. You must know. The unexpected king takes 
he took with the king he kept his knight here so the knight could go in the center and then um you know although the king was there was struggling a little bit but he always had the opportunity to go back if he wanted this way he developed a little bit faster there was no e5 he always stopped his opponent and yeah he made a small inaccuracy but i think overall it was like a really beautiful beautifully played game and sometimes you got to be lucky as well for your opponent to make a blunder to win but anyways that's all from me today it was it was great being here i hope you guys enjoyed it we'll have more things going on uh tomorrow i think i'm doing i'm analyzing games i believe that's um what i'm doing i'm also streaming on t on uh, san luis chess club's twitch page so i hope to see you there and um uh, um, yeah, I hope you're all having a wonderful night and um, I'll be seeing you very soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>